Hi. <laughs> well, it's really good to be here in Bernie. Um, first of all, you know, you guys got to give yourselves a round of applause just for being here. Do that for me. Because I am told all the time by people who are thinking about getting into crypto or who just got in, I'm too late. And uh, my friend got in in 2013 or 2011, or my friend has a mining facility or what have you. And I hear this all the time. I'm too late. You're not too late. The fact that you're sitting in this room and it's not packed to the gills means that you're not too late. And I actually want to take this opportunity since we do have a, uh, a small group here today, and I know it's going to get a little bit bigger. This is a more intimate setting today to give you guys a little bit of my background, uh, how I got into this space, and sort of my philosophy on how I invest in these things. Before I got into crypto, I really wanted to own my own business. And how many of you guys own your own businesses? Good amount. We all want to own our own business, right? 60 million people right, right before the pandemic were participating in what's called the gig economy. Are you guys familiar with that? Uber, Lyft, Fiverr, Airbnb, all of these applications that have allowed us to, in some way, take back control of our own finances and generate a, usually a substantive income, right? Supplementary income. Then the pandemic hit and people started to realize they were actually giving up a lot of their time and a lot of their effort in order to participate in these businesses. In fact, it wasn't just the gig economy that these people were realizing, it was pretty much every economy. 40% of workers now don't wanna go back to work, 40%. And it's not because they're necessarily lazy, of course some of them are, <laughs> let's be real, but some had the opportunity to realize there's gotta be more. There's gotta be more to this than just spending all of my time to make ends meet. Something like 30% of the people in this country, if they were to receive a random $400 unexpected bill, would go bankrupt. And they're working multiple jobs. Through the pandemic, people couldn't even feed their children. They actually had to make the choice. Am I gonna eat tonight or is my kid? How is that okay in America? This is supposed to be the greatest country in the, in the entire world. Leading economy, not faltering. And we are faltering. And we saw during the pandemic trillions of dollars being printed out of thin air. And people started to wake up. They're like, what? wait a minute, they can do that? It's actually written in the law that they can't. Makes no sense. And we start to see inflation and the effects of inflation. And Ben talks about it on his show all the time. We start to see these commodities skyrocketing in price because it's really difficult to get them, supply and demand. And again, people are falling out of their jobs all the time. COVID, of course, creating issues with supply chains. Yada, 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 you've heard it all. So now people are like, okay, I wanna do my own thing. And when I was a kid, I wanted to do my own thing. When I was 14, I started my first business mowing lawns. How many of you guys mowed lawns, rake leaves? Yeah. I knew from a young age that I didn't want to work the way that most people work. I wanted to do it myself. And so after high school, I started my first business. It was actually a computer business. I was always really into technology. I liked taking apart my dad's DVD players. He hated it, but I would always put them back together. Don't worry. So I started this computer business because I was really into gaming and we started building computers for people uh, that were also gamers. But then somebody called me and asked me to build a machine that I had never ever heard of before. This incredibly powerful machine that I was like, what are you possibly using this for? This was gonna be a $20,000 device. And he says, I'm mining Bitcoin. I was like, what? <laughs> well, you're mining Bitcoin. This thing was probably 2012 when this happened. So that was my first introduction to Bitcoin. And I built the miner. And then we actually started building a lot of miners for people. And this is back in the days when you could actually mine on a graphics card. Can't do that anymore. Well, not successfully. And I did mine a little bit of Bitcoin. I tried it out. I wanted to see what it was all about. I read about wallets and these things. But it was incredibly abstract. There was absolutely no information out there that was substantive. I had no idea what I was doing. I threw that hard drive away. It's probably worth 
tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> but a lot of us have that story. Didn't really hear about crypto for a little while. Um, that business ultimately failed, actually. Um, I didn't know exactly how to scale the business. We realized that we were getting a lot of orders, but it was only because we were undercutting everyone else on price. So if we wanted to hire somebody to build the computers, we would actually go bankrupt. <laughs> so I learned a lot about scaling businesses there, little hard knocks learning. I tried a couple of other startups, I had a blog, some websites, and eventually I just went back to freelancing for myself. But I always had found a way to make extra money on the side um, by doing my own thing. And then a buddy of mine called me and he goes, I met this guy Joe Lubin in New York and he told me about this thing Ethereum. You know about Bitcoin, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I kind of know about it. But he's like, Ethereum is like the next generation. You have to invest in this thing. It's 30 cents right now. And I was like, I don't know, dude. I've heard about this crypto thing. It seems kind of, eh, I'm not into it. He's like, please. And he just hammered me every single day. Like, and he kept meeting with Joe Lubin in New York. And he's like, please, it was 80 cents now. He's like, dude, it was 30, now it's 80. Please just jump, jump in. So I was like, all right, fine. I've had very little money at this point. I had no, basically nothing to invest. So I was like, is $1,000 enough? He's like, yeah, anything you can do. So I meet up with a guy because there was no Coinbase. There was no easy on-ramps. And there was no Bitcoin Ben to call. So he, he has me meet up with this guy at a mall. And I'm like, this is, I've done something like this before. And I don't know. So I, I meet up with this guy. He sits down. He pulls out this huge laptop. And he, he has me download a Bitcoin wallet, which was the Airbits wallet, which is now called Edge. Paul Pugh has uh, become a friend, actually ironically, uh, and he's the CEO of Edge. And he, he teaches me how to back up my private keys and seed phrase and all this stuff. And I hand him the cash and he sends me the Bitcoin. Unfortunately, that same guy is in jail right now for doing exactly that. Not with me, he did it with a federal agent, which is a story for another time. But it is unfortunate that some people have had to be martyrs in this space to get us to where we are today. So I went and I bought my Ethereum, which by the way, he was vehemently against. He's like, do not buy ETH. Bitcoin's the king. You're an idiot if you buy it. I ignored him. And thank God I did. Because at the time when I bought it at the 85 cents or a dollar, it then shot up to $8. And something came out called the DAO. Uh, anyone familiar with the DAO? Yeah, a couple guys. The DAO was the first smart contract on Ethereum, it was the first ICO. It was supposed to be this decentralized autonomous organization, this crazy white paper that no one could understand. I'm not even sure the guys who wrote it can understand it, to be honest. And it raised $50 million worth of Ethereum. Insane, unprecedented, it was in the news, it was everywhere, and then it got hacked, and everything was gone, all drained. And I was sour, man. I mean, I was really upset, because I lost basically everything that I had gained. And it hurt. And I was like, this is a scam. I should have listened to the guy in the mall. Crypto sucks. I'm done. And I gave up. I did. And eventually, another buddy of mine uh, said that this was probably you know, two or three years later. He's like, dude, I've been buying Ethereum. It's like $80. I was like, wait, what? 80 so I check my wallet and I actually had some left. So I didn't lose 100% of my value. And I was like, okay, I can rebuild. But this time I'm not gonna do it the way I did it before. I'm not gonna blindly invest in stuff. I'm not just gonna get into projects because somebody says it's cool. I need to know what this technology is. I'm a developer. I should know what I'm doing when I'm, when I'm getting into this stuff. And that's when I started developing my own strategy for how to invest in cryptocurrency. And it really comes down to one thing, fundamental value. And fundamentals are, of course, a dynamic word. They, they trickle down, we're gonna talk about that. But it's important because right now, especially in crypto, it's almost all talk. All the hype coins and the Shiba Inus and Dogecoins and things like that, they're fun and they're cute and everything like that, 
but they represent the opposite of fundamentals. They represent the reason that I got into crypto in the first place, which is, I don't know, somebody told me I could make a bunch of money. There is a way to make money with cryptocurrency. There's many ways to make money with cryptocurrency, but doing it the right way will give you the longevity that you need to make this not just a flash in the pan or a way to you know, pay off your house or whatever, but to have long-term value for many, many years to come. Because as we know now, crypto is here to stay and it's not going anywhere. We have countries adopting it. We have huge businesses adopting it. The, the it's a Ponzi scheme, it's a criminal enterprise narrative. It has no weight anymore. This is a real thing. So let's talk about this. First of all, there are basically, in my mind, four ways that you can earn with cryptocurrency. There's trading, there's mining, there's staking, and there's running a node. Trading is not easy. Has anyone ever tried to trade cryptocurrency? Has anyone lost money doing this? I think more people raised their hands that time. <laughs> okay, it's really difficult to trade. And if you're just sitting at a computer trading, you're gonna lose because you're trading against high frequency algorithmic trading bots that will absolutely decimate you no matter what you do. It's just really, really, really difficult. Some people can do it, but you also have to then sit there for hours upon hours a day, researching, reading, and watching charts with four screens in front of you and all this and that. That's not what we want, right? Let's go back to the beginning of, of this speech. We want something that allows us to take control of our finances and not waste all of our time doing it. So trading, that's not the answer. What about mining? Is anyone a miner? Very few. So mining is uh, how proof of work blockchains come to a consensus. And what that means is basically when you're, in, uh, when you're sending a transaction, let's say I send you Bitcoin, I'm submitting this transaction to a network of computers basically. And all those computers are being run by Ben and his wife and me and Josh in the back and all of you. And basically all of the computers that are being run in the Bitcoin network have to work or run their hardware in order to solve a complex calculation. I like to think of it as like a Sudoku puzzle or a crossword puzzle. But instead of like a normal human being playing Sudoku, it just throws as many combinations of numbers at the page as it possibly can until finally it's correct. And all of them are doing this, but only one can be correct. And once that one correct Sudoku puzzle comes out, all of my transactions with you and me are added to the blockchain forever. That's proof of work. And the more computers that are doing this, the more difficult those tra transactions become to solve, the more difficult those Sudoku puzzles get, and it requires incredible amounts of power. The other problem is the government can just shut you down, as we've seen in, in China. China's been talking about banning Bitcoin for ever, and they finally are finding a way to do it because Almost all, well, more than half, I should say, of Bitcoin's hash power went to China. Over 60% of all the Bitcoin transactions, all of me and you sending back and forth, were being mined by China. And China just said, it's over. Now all these mining farms had to shut down. So again, super expensive, huge amount of power, warehouses. Maybe I can buy one from you and set up my mining operation, but I don't have $8.6 million to put into a mining farm. Incredibly cost intensive. It's just not the right strategy. Then there is staking and master notes, which is of course, in a very biased way, what I'm going to tell you is the best. So during my journey into crypto, I went through many avenues. Um, you know, I was a developer, so I worked on a few projects, did some websites and things like that. Um, I, of course, invested in it and tried to, to do things of that nature. And eventually, I got the opportunity to create a website for a project called Divi. And uh, actually, the same buddy who said that he was buying at 80 was the one that got me the job to write the website. And it was really a crazy concept because all of the struggles that I had gone through 
with getting Bitcoin and meeting the guy in the mall and doing all these things and losing tons of money because I didn't understand seemed to be resolved by the philosophy that this project was building. Can we make this incredibly complex ecosystem friendly for literally anyone to use without sacrificing what makes it great, which is decentralization? Of course, we could sacrifice the decentralization like Coinbase has or some others to make it a little bit more convenient. But it seems like every time we sacrifice something for convenience, we lose something too, right? With social media, we sacrificed our privacy for convenience of communication and connection. We didn't realize it at the time, but it happened. And there's no going back from that. I would hate to see the same thing happen with cryptocurrency. If we sacrifice decentralization for convenience, we're making a mistake because it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. It can be done. So they brought me into Divi. I really liked the idea of making crypto easy. And they had this unique model for earning additional crypto, making your crypto work for you, called masternodes. Now, masternodes weren't a new thing. Dash was the first one to create masternodes. And there was a bunch of coins coming out at the time. It was actually a lot like the DeFi movement is right now, where there was a ton of noise and very, very, very little signal. But they had this great idea because masternodes are really difficult to set up. Even for a developer like myself, you had to spend hours going through command line, reading documentation. It was just a hassle. They wanted to create the first one-click masternode. And they, our philosophy was, if we can make this one thing easy, which is ultimately the most important thing to people, right? How do I earn more with my crypto? If I can make that easy, then we can make the rest of it easy too. And in 2018, that's exactly what we did. We deployed the first one-click masternode on our own blockchain called the Divi blockchain. And it worked. People of all walks of life started deploying these masternodes and earning the rates of return that we had programmed in. A lot of people say like, oh, how are you getting paid? I don't understand. Like, with mining, I get it, my computer's running and, and supporting the network. It's the same idea. It's supporting the network. The coins that you allocate to the masternodes are actually supporting, verifying the transactions within the network, and you get paid as a result. It's all programmed in. We're not giving you anything. Divi doesn't pay you back. Divi doesn't take your money and invest it. It's not a bank. It's literally programmatic. It's a really cool thing. So we deployed the one-click masternode. We deployed one-click staking as well because we realized that with Dash, it had already priced out most of its competitors. Uh, Dash masternode, I think at the time, was like 300 grand, 400 grand. I don't think most people have 400 grand to just jump into crypto, especially it being such a nascent thing. So we said, okay, what we'll do is we'll make five different masternodes and we'll also allow people to stake with that as little as 10,000 Divi. So what do I mean by five different masternodes? You have five, we call them basically tiers or entry points. This lowers the barrier of entry. And again, our philosophy panned out because you have the ability to just get in with a few thousand dollars or $400,000, however much you can tolerate. And if you don't have that, then you just stake. Now, staking differs from masternodes. Again, a lot of people ask me about this, and I will go over this a little bit more tomorrow in my talk, and we'll actually get into it on the screen and, and dive deep. But basically, staking is what uh, is the proof that Bitcoin does as work. Uh, so proof of work, proof of stake. Staking is actually adding those blocks of transactions to the network. That, that uh, transaction you and I sent, Instead of all those computers in China doing it, it's just some computer in the cloud doing it. It takes a lot less energy and it's way more efficient and then can actually be run on a cell phone. Again, the whole philosophy is, can we make this accessible and easy for literally everyone, everywhere, not just the people who understand? So uh, that's, that's the high level. And this, is, this, this strategy has done very well for me and for the people who have engaged with it. I've had, had an overwhelming amount of love and support from the people in this crowd this week already. Um, have, I've had the opportunity to have lunch with some of you 
and you've told me your stories about how you've gotten into Divi and, and what you're doing with it in your communities. And it's, it's, it's just, it floors me. It, I don't, I'm speechless, I have nothing to say because to see a currency that we created be utilized in the way that we envisioned and actually influencing people in a positive way, it, you just can't put any words to that. Other than love, maybe. And this is where the fundamentals come in, right? So anybody can make a system that produces income. Anybody can generate a new coin. I mean, it's super easy to make new coins now, but where is the fundamental value? And it's in a few different things. First of all, it's the team. The team behind projects that you guys are looking into, and I'm not just talking about Divi, this is any project, needs to be A, transparent and visible, and B, experienced in what they're doing. If they're just random pictures on a website, chances are you're not gonna have that money for very long. It's also really important that they've weathered the storm, right? This industry is only 12 years old, but we've gone through four bear and bull cycles. Those are big spikes in price and huge, huge crashes of which we're experiencing one right now, right? Industry-wide. The teams that are able to get through that are more likely to succeed in the future long term. That is incredibly important because, especially for us at Divi, we didn't raise very much money in the beginning. We raised about $2 million versus our competitors who were raising 40 million, 100 million, 200 million even. And of course, EOS raised a billion. But again, story for another time. So we started with what a normal startup probably would. I think Google started with a million and a half and Amazon maybe two million. I could be wrong on the numbers, but you get what I'm saying. So we had to build against huge competitors in a space that is incredibly volatile. And we weathered the storm longer than a majority of them. In fact, we've created more value for our coin holders than about 90% of the other ICOs that launched at the same time. And a lot of them are just gone, entirely gone, exit scammed or what have you. So that's a big part of it. Then you have to look at the actual use case. Is there a real use for this coin? Is it being used in the ecosystem or is it being used in the economy, in the real world? And that's where this outpouring of love has really invigorated me, reinvigorated me, because I'm starting to see, after four years of working on this, it actually being used. I had a guy um, call me, he's a, he's a pretty big coin holder, and he, uh, he needed to remodel his house. He was able to do that with Divi. I had another guy who paid for his wedding with Divi. I, know, I met a guy the other day uh, at lunch who's paying his rent in Divi. Not cashing it out and paying with cash. He's paying his rent with Divi. That's huge. I know of many, many other stories that echo this. People are going out into their communities, just like we were just talking about in the last presentation, and becoming the expert in their field, telling people about what they've been able to do with Divi, what it means, how they're generating an income, and then convincing those people that we can create our own circular economy. We don't have to worry about them printing trillions of dollars and deflating our currency, or I'm sorry, inflating our currency to the point of essentially uselessness. I mean, the US dollar has lost, what is it, 92% of its purchasing power since 1970? More than that, yeah. So if, <laughs> If you had a pension fund, like Ben's dad, back in 1970, you're getting nothing when you retire. It's absolutely criminal. Crypto solves this. And again, it's not just Divi. I'm using Divi because that's the project that I work on, but there are thousands. There's over 10,000 coins out there. How do I sift through it? You can use some of the advice that I just gave. You wanna look at the team, the fundamentals, the, get, the use case, and the business case. Does it have the legs to, to stand on? We're at the point now where we're working with national governments to incorporate our wallet into their ecosystems. And my business partner, Jeff, was actually on a delegation that went down to El Salvador, and he's working directly with them to basically give them advice. He's become an expert in his community, right? 
So much so that the people of another country are willing to bring him in and say, how should we look at this stuff? How do we know where the scams are? How do we know this guy's not just a snake oil salesman, right? It's really important that you get out there and you start talking to people because you'll start getting questions that you don't know the answer to, right? And then you can go get the answer and then you become more of an expert. We're always learning. If you're not learning something in crypto, you're, you're not in crypto because every day something changes every single day. So I've been talking for a while. You guys are probably bored. Let's, let's take some questions. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions about Divi, about crypto, about literally anything? I'm happy to answer. Where do you get Divi? Or how do you get That's a great question. So his question was, how do you get Divi? Right now, uh, you can go on any number of exchanges, um, but there are also, we're on KuCoin and some of the big exchanges, um, but you can also reach out to some community experts that will help onboard you to the project. In the near future, the very near future, before the end of this year, you'll actually be able to purchase Divi right from our mobile wallet, which is available now for us here in the US. That's the wallet. Yeah, that's it. Right? Yeah, that's it. Later this year, we're going to launch that feature. Yep. Yes, sir. Fiat on ramp. Yep. That's a great question. So the fear is that uh, staking on a laptop, which is connected to the internet, exposes you to security risk. And that's, that's an excellent question, by the way. So the answer is, first of all, the network is really what secures your coins. As long as you have good personal security hygiene, you're not going to run into any security issues as far as the network is concerned. Because the more people that are staking, the harder it is for someone to attack and take the money. Now, the biggest way that people lose money is actually social engineering, right? Somebody tricking you into giving them your private keys or what have you. Right now, the best thing that you can do, again, is just lock up your seed phrase in a safe, offline. That's very, very secure. That's about as secure as it's going to get. But in basically the next few weeks, you'll be able to stake right from your mobile device. And you could actually have a separate mobile device that you can turn off because we actually just invented something new that allows people to do the same thing that your masternode does. So with Divi, when you set up a masternode, once it's set up, it's in the cloud. So you can turn your computer off. You don't have to keep it running 24 seven. But the problem is with staking, you do right now. Our new invention, which has actually been out for a little while now, but is coming to the, the client soon, the, the wallet soon, allows you to turn your computer off and stake without sacrificing your keys or your coins. You guys are really kind. <laughs> I hope that that answer you. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go over to this side and I'll come back to you. Question. So what, um, what is Divi looking at in the future using masternodes for? So we've actually had a few proposals recently. Um, we, we've talked internally about doing, uh, the, sorry, the question was, what, do, what is Divi looking at using the masternodes for in the future? Um, because they're not contributing new blocks to the network. They're just verifying the transactions. They're basically free space, right? They're just computers, servers in the, in the ecosystem that really don't do very much right now. So we've talked uh, internally about using them for like a, a, a torrent file system. We've talked about using them for a VPN system. Um, but we recently just had a project come to us. And I can't really say much about this yet, unfortunately that is launching their own network and sees Divi's node ecosystem as good leverage to secure their network as a, as a first layer. Um, and that may be the direction that we go. The beauty is it's open source and literally anybody can come up with an idea. You know, the blockchain is not really ours. We developed it and deployed it, but anyone can use it. Um, so yeah, those are some of the ideas. And if anybody does have additional ideas, I am all ears. But uh, currently, we're not using them for really very much. Right there. I have two questions. The question was, when will the Divi wallet be available internationally? And where will we be in 12 months? 
Love these questions, by the way. <laughs> so um, the Divi wallet will be available first in the EU and the UK. Um, that'll be our, our next launch jurisdiction, what have you. Um, I'd like to get that done this month, but we're really just waiting for some final things with GDPR right now. Um, it's, it's ready to go. I mean, if you've, if you've used it in the US, you know that it works fine. It's really just a legal thing and it's just dragging. It's, it's very annoying. Um, in 12 months, I would like to have our DeFi bridge up and running and start demonstrating how we can uh, begin to tr not transition away from the layer one, but start building upon the layer one blockchain with new feature sets like smart contracts, Ethereum virtual machine compatibility, and some of the things that give us a more competitive edge when it comes to uh, the DeFi space. You made more money staking or in a masternode? The cool thing about the question again was, uh, do you make more money staking or running a masternode? It, the way that the algorithm is designed, it basically influences people to go in one direction or the other. So right now staking is, is actually more profitable, but if more people start to stake, masternodes will become more profitable. And it kind of seesaws back and forth like that. And we did this purposefully so that the ecosystem was never too heavily weighted in one direction or the other. But yeah, technically right now staking is a little bit more profitable. Any plans for NFT? Any plans for NFTs was the question. So uh, when I'm talking about, you know, EVM compatibility and things like that, yes, I think, you know, NFTs will be a part of that. Um, but ancillary of us, we have Jeff McCabe, my partner, is working on a project called Lightning Works, which is a digital comic book app. It's really cool. They're all digital NFTs, limited edition comics, and they kind of move. It's a, it's a really unique project. It comes with this whole creator app, so you can actually make your own comic books, too. And we're working with DC and Marvel um, X writers and, and illustrators on this, and we're going to do physical toys and, and of course, NFTs to go with those toys. So that's kind of our focus on NFTs. But once the EVM compatibility is there, literally everything is, is possible. Now in the back. So that's a great question. It was, do you know when the Visa card, the Divi Visa card will be available? I should say Divi debit card, but I think we are going to work with Visa. Um, so we've actually had it like almost across the line three or four times. And we've realized that there are a lot of mistakes that can be made, both legally and jurisdictionally. And this is a great thing because a lot of other coins have tried to launch debit cards that have flopped really hard. And there's some that have absolutely crushed it. So we've had the opportunity, of course, to learn from those mistakes and successes. Um, I don't really know when it'll be available, to be honest, because of all of the intricacies of the, of the legal framework, especially keeping it decentralized, uh, keeping the app decentralized. And then, of course, the card is not because it's Visa. Um, that's really challenging. I wish I could give you a better answer, but it's being worked on and uh, we're working with a really strong partner on it. So hopefully soon. I can't I can't promise anything, but that would be my goal. Oh, I'm sorry. This one right here. Yeah. The question was, what are the five tiers of Masternode? Great question. So um, it's copper, silver, gold, platinum, and diamond. It's actually based on Dungeons and Dragons, believe it or not. <laughs> of course. Um, and so basically the way that it works is each tier requires a little bit more Divi to be allocated to it. Remember, this Divi is always yours, and you can always dismantle the node. It's never in our hands. It's never in anyone's hands except yours. Each node uh, level, because you're allocating more, offers essentially a 5% increased chance at winning a uh, reward. Um, so the, uh, the diamond node is 20% more likely to earn a reward than the copper. They'll all earn them but you'll make a lot more with, of course, the diamond. Um, and I, again, I'll go over this a lot more in depth tomorrow with, with you know, visuals and stuff, but that's the basics. Thank you. Right here. So you've talked a lot about community and you were meeting with the community people here in Green. Um, can you give a little bit of more, a better explanation of how Divi will serve the community as 
far as like businesses and the city, what will that look like? Absolutely. The question was how will, to paraphrase, how will Divi uh, serve the community in a positive way here in Bernie? and hopefully in other communities as well. Now, we actually had the opportunity to meet with some of the members of the Chamber of Commerce the other night, actually here at Peggy's on the Green. Uh, yeah, that, it was an amazing meeting, um, and one of the women from the city as well. And they asked basically the same question. The beauty of accepting Divi, let's say, as payment, is you're mitigating the, A, fees that are uh, incurred by swiping your credit card, which right now I think Stripe is 3.5%, something like that. So there's basically no fees on Divi. Um, it's, it's like 0. 0. 0. 0. you know, <laughs> Divi. And we're working all the time to lower them. Also, you're able to utilize that additional Divi to put into staking and masternodes. So now some of the expenses, and we've actually seen this exact thing happen with churches, businesses, um, you put them into nodes, now you're earning that additional income even if you're not at work, right? Even if you're not at the shop or at the business, that node is still producing an income that you can use to mitigate some of your expenses. Take an actual vacation. How many, how many business owners actually take a vacation? Small business owners? Never. Especially not in the first few years. This allows you to have a little bit more freedom. I'm not looking to replace your point of sale system. I'm not looking to replace USD. I'm looking to supplement what's already happening and give you more opportunity. The other nice thing is, if you accept crypto, you're gonna have a lot more people who own crypto coming to your shop. So it's another almost marketing technique. And we're seeing this, um, probably the best example is with uh, a religious group where I live in San Diego called the uh, Agape House. And they actually provide student housing to homeless children, homeless kids uh, and adults at the college, UCS, or, uh, SDSU. Let me say it again. Homeless students in college in America. This is happening. I didn't know it was happening actually, but it is. And um, my significant other's dad came to me and he, he told me about this. He's like, can we set up a master node for the Agape House? Because we're trying to build a new uh, facility and we still have to feed the kids, provide them with you know, physical education, things like that. So we did. And because of that, they're able to focus more of their funds on the things that they need to do while they build out this amazing new facility for more and more kids who, who need their services. It's a big deal. I hope that answered. We could talk more about it after too, if you'd like. So one last question. Going back to what you said previously, you said right now, it's currently better to stay, you get more reward staking than you do having a node. How does that, can you explain more how that works and how you can tell, like I'm, I'm a part of the Divi um, uh, Telegram group and the support group and the, you know, all the Divi groups, but, um, and I know you can put in your node and see history or you can put in your staking, what your stake, right. what the, like, how do you, figure that out to know whether you could like, you know what I mean? Like for if you, like you said right now, it's more profitable to stake, stake versus ha have a note. So would it be worth dismantling a node to stake? You know what I mean? And then playing with that system. How do you figure out? Yeah, how that goes? that's a, That's a great question. So essentially what was asked is how do you know when it's better to stake or run a master node and what kind of, just to paraphrase, what, how do you strategize, right? Should I dismantle my node and get into staking just because it's better? The answer is really no. You shouldn't, you shouldn't because as I explained to him, when you, when you move to staking, if more people start moving to staking, the master nodes will become more profitable. It's like getting in line uh, when there's two lines at, at, the, at the restaurant and you're like, oh, that one's shorter. And you run over and it's like, oh, damn, okay, right? So. It's, it's the seesaw effect. Um, now, in order to know when uh, staking is more profitable or master nodes, there are several tools online. So stakingrewards.com is a third party website. We don't own it um, that does their own calculations. Master nodes online is another one, third party. They do their own calculations based on historic information as well as they run their own nodes. 
Um, we also have some community members that have created their own tools. There's a staking calculator on our website as well. But I always recommend that people look at third parties because a third party has no real reason to lie to you. Not that I do either, but it's always best to get as much information as you can to develop a, a good strategy for yourself. Now, what I always tell people is with your masternode rewards, stake them. And the beautiful thing is when we launched the staking vaults in the wallet, which is the uh, offline solution that I just described, you'll be able to stake as little as one divi. So no longer will you have the 10,000 divi limit. You can stake literally any amount. So all of your rewards that you're earning for your masternode, just throw them in staking. It does not. So the question was, um, a lot of staking projects lock your funds for a certain amount of time. And in many cases, it's 21 days. That's what's called delegated proof of stake. That's like EOS um, or Secret and some others. A lot of, uh, a lot of projects went that direction in order to um, sort of jumpstart their scalability. But it also centralizes things. And it makes it so that your stakes aren't really your stakes until you claim them. It's not necessarily a huge deal, but it is kind of inconvenient and it goes against the philosophy of Divi. So no, you do not have to lock your funds. You can unstake anytime and spend them anytime. And it should always be like that in my opinion. I've not yet downloaded the Divi app, although I do have a couple notes. Uh, do I understand that the app can actually host the note as opposed to putting it in the cloud like they're currently doing? Right, so in, in uh, the mobile app, the question, I'm sorry, was, um, can the mobile application, the Divi mobile wallet, host your node um, instead of hosting it on your desktop wallet? The answer is yes, but it still works in a similar way in that the, um, it's kind of a communication master nodes. Basically, you have your node on the ground, let's say, and you have your node in the, cl in the cloud, and they communicate with one another. The one on the ground doesn't have to be on all the time because the one in the cloud is keeping the copy of the blockchain running. And as long as you don't move the funds from the one on the ground, it knows that the funds are still there. It works very, very similarly in the mobile wallet um, in that it's still a cloud-based server for the, for the one on the, in, the, in the sky. Um, however, it works somewhat differently. And again, I'll get more into the technicals of this tomorrow, um, but it's basically the same. But right now in the Divi mobile wallet, you can, you can host your master node for free for a limited time. So. Yeah, the, that's a good point. So a lot of people, when we launched the mobile wallet, um, tried to recover their seed phrase from their desktop wallet into the mobile wallet. You don't want to do that. The mobile wallet is structured in a very different way. So just, just if you want to do this, dismantle your node, send the funds, and then reset up your node. The information that's on the node is also decentralized wherever the node is. Yeah, so the question is, is the, are the cloud nodes decentralized to the extent that they can be. Um, we use like a round robin technique across various data centers and data center providers um, so that it always is distributed. But the nice thing with master nodes is that the keys and coins never go anywhere. They're always where they start. So they are always on your phone or they're always on your computer. Um, the cloud holds no personal information. It doesn't even hold any information about your node other than that there was a transaction that was made. Um, so even if something did go wrong um, and those data centers were hacked, nothing would happen. Your node would just go down. Your, co your keys and coins would be safe at all times. I thought I heard that the app on the phone is really nearly a portal to the blockchain, which is where everything sits. Yeah, basically, uh, you know, they're called clients. Um, or, inter you know, it's just an interface to the blockchain. Um, I don't know how deep you want me to go into it, but essentially they're called uh, light clients, right? So your, your desktop app is a full node, which means it carries an entire copy of the entire history of the blockchain from day one till today. Um, that's why when you turn on your desktop wallet, and this is true for a lot of coins, you turn on your desktop wallet, it takes forever to sync up because it has to get all of the history. With a light client, it takes all of the fundamental pieces of your wallet, which are your coins, your keys, 
Um, it's really just your, your private keys, your seed phrase, and the things that secure your wallet. That's all stored on your device in an encrypted manner. Um, so only you can hold it. It's never transmitted over the air or anything like that. And then it, it basically, how I put it simply like uh, interfaces with the rest of the network um, through APIs. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, we got one more. In the beginning, you'll have to do it manually. You have to add funds, because a lot of people do want to spend their funds in other ways, too. Um, but we will offer features that allow you to, we call it like deploy your dust. <laughs> um, so reinvest your earnings in various ways. And it won't just be with staking vaults. We'll actually allow you to invest in our DeFi bridge and, and deploy capital that way, um, or do other things within the ecosystem that aren't even built yet. Um, like diversify your portfolio, swap between your favorite coins, things like that. We want to make all of that stuff automated so that you can focus on, you know, building your own businesses, doing the things that you want to do in your own life. Basically, we just want to make crypto easy. Yeah. Where was it? That's a great question. The question is essentially how long can you earn? What happens? You know how with Bitcoin, there's only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be in existence. With Divi, uh, there is actually no supply cap, so which scares a lot of people. You know, it sounds inflationary. The way that we've devised the system is so that it actually um, creates less and less Divi over time. It never stops creating Divi, though, unless we all vote that we want, want it to stop, which we can. And then we would just find another way for people to earn, whether that be fees, which I don't like that idea, but uh, there's, there's many different uh, methodologies out there for continuous earnings. Now, um, if you look at Bitcoin, which is of course deflationary to the point of literally ending, and then ultimately relies on its fees to pay its miners, which we don't know if that's going to be profitable for those miners, because if the velocity of payments in the Bitcoin ecosystem isn't high by the time that that happens, those miners won't be earning anything and they'll shut off. And that's very dangerous for Bitcoin. I don't think that'll happen, but that's, you know, it's, in, it's well written. Um, with Divi, we actually have a more aggressive deflationary model for the first four years than Bitcoin did. So you'll continue to earn your percentage. It will fluctuate because the more people that engage with Divi, uh, the more people are getting paid out. So of course, that percentage will change slightly over time. But the thought is, that the more value that the ecosystem brings, the less that lower percentage will matter. Uh, if, if you were to approach a business to accept Divi, how exactly would you present that to them in lieu of taking Diesel or in addition to taking whatever? Sure. How are they going to accept that? The question was, how do you approach a business and ask them to accept Divi? And this could really be for any cryptocurrency, this answer. So, of course, there are uh, a million and one uh, different cryptocurrencies out there. So you want to maybe focus in on one or two. Um, when you go to the business, you want to show them, A, how to use the wallet, which we did again with the Chamber of Commerce the other night. Me and Ben pulled out our wallets and we showed them how easy it was to just scan the QR code and boom. So easily that person could literally print their QR code and put it on the the, the cash wrap or whatever it is. Um, of course, you want to have maybe a sticker in the window that says, we accept Bitcoin, we accept Divi. That's the easiest way. The problem is, how do you account for that? And that's where a lot of people just stop talking about it, right? I don't like to ignore the challenges that we face as an ecosystem or as an industry, um, because when you spend crypto, it's a taxable event, it's moving property from one person to another, and that business has to account for it on their back office. I want to pull up my CFO, Russell, because he can explain exactly how we do this in our business, because we are almost a 100% crypto business. We rarely deal with fiat. You come up? We, okay, if you want to talk about it tomorrow, or on Sunday. Okay.
Okay, so if you guys are around on Sunday, Russ is going to give a full, full on presentation about this stuff. Um, so sorry to cut that answer off, but basically the easiest way from the very base level is go in there, show them how easy it is to use it, get their QR code out there, and just have a, a presence that says, we accept crypto. Right. So one of the problems with Bitcoin is that it's not really equipped for microtransactions. Although the Lightning Network does solve this to an extent, now you have to explain to a business what the Lightning Network is, which is like another challenge in itself. Um, Divi is microtransaction ready because the fees are basically non-existent. Um, you can send, you know, modicums of money micro sense, whatever. Um, so it works well for e-commerce and it works well for small transactions in person like coffee, bananas, those sorts of things. I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're supposed to talk about Sunday. So you're going to expand on how a business can accept cryptos and keep track of them so that your bookkeeper doesn't lose their money. And you go to your accountant and he's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh yeah. Right. Like, you know, so, like, right. How, as a business owner, it's like I, now we got fiat, we've got cryptos, and I can just see my bookkeeper and my account's heads exploding. Oh yeah, my bookkeeper hates me. He's just no. Um, it, yes, that's basically the question was if you guys couldn't hear. Um, you know, Will and Russell be going over how the back office works? when it comes to a, an accounting perspective of how you accept crypto into your business and how you account for it on your taxes and things like that. And the nice thing is that there are a lot of new tools coming out for uh, maintaining and tracking your taxes. Um, because basically each time that you earn or spend cryptocurrency, you have to record how much it was at that time. Because if it goes up, now you have a capital gains event. If it goes down, you have capital loss, um, which can be helpful. It's really, really complex. It's gonna make your accountant hate you, trust me. But because of the tools that are starting to come out like TaxBit and some others, all of this is becoming automated, just like it is with QuickBooks. And eventually I'm sure QuickBooks will have their own integration, but there are tools, don't worry, to already make this much, much easier than it has been in the past. And yeah, Russ will get way more deep into it. So for staff members that are crypto, they're into it, they're like, well, if we can take crypto, can we get paid? Some Awesome. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot to think about when it comes to that. I can tell you that I, um, a lot of our uh, employees do get paid in crypto. Some have hybrid, you know, crypto fiat payments. Um, so it, it can be very complex, but you're, you're going to be talking to a, a person who's an absolute expert with that. So rest easy. Yeah, that's uh, the question is, will you ever be able to borrow against Divi, um, like lend it out and, and get fiat for it? Um, yeah, that's definitely one of the things that's like on our horizon, um, especially as it pertains to the DeFi bridge. So we're working toward bridging uh, Divi, it's layer one blockchain to Ethereum. And that allows you to get into basically every DeFi ecosystem, Aave, Compound, the things that allow you to do that right now, lend your crypto and get um, value in return. Um, but we also have many financial partners that we want to work toward doing that with. It's not something that we're like, there's of course the things that we need to execute on first, but yeah, 100% it's on our radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. If, 
Yeah, we have Josh here. He's our chief innovation officer and Russell's our CFO. Frisco's in the back, He's, he does all our videos. Um, if you guys have more questions, I know I'm running out of time here. Um, feel free to come up to all of us, ask questions, um, and we can we can get into it. We love talking, so <laughs> obviously. Uh, I think maybe I have time for one more before we wrap up. If we, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go to him just because we already. But I'll talk to you afterwards. All right. No, it was over here. <laughs> What's up? Nice to see you again, Nick. Um, you too. Sorry, I stepped out for a second. And if you already covered it, but I was just curious, like a roadmap, I, I heard you have an app. How are you gonna make it where Divi is more acceptable for businesses and widespread with, are you gonna be working with, you know, uh, Cash App or Strike or anything like that? And yeah, it's a great question. How do you, how do we make Divi more acceptable and accessible to businesses? Um, so a big part of it is, of course, the application. The, the app is more than just staking in master nodes and sending and receiving Divi, Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum. Um, it's really a payments ecosystem. So we want to be able to enable people to onboard themselves into crypto, accept crypto at their businesses, um, swap between cryptos, and actually have our app will allow people to have what is essentially a bank account. So you actually be able to custody your money in the app. Um, in the future, we actually just had a great call. Of course, I can't say anything yet, but. Uh, with a financial services company that has a lot of the same um, features as like a Stripe or a Square. Um, so that'll be big for getting integrated. Integration is obviously step one. You wanna get integrated into the points of sale um, that people are already using. Trying to convince people to change their behavior has never in the history of business worked ever. <laughs> and it never will. You have to adapt. We always talk about like mass adoption. It should be mass adaptation. Crypto already makes you change your behavior in so many different ways that we need to be more integration friendly. And so, yeah, that's, that's a huge part, but it really is probably next year more of a focus. Okay, I gotta wrap it up. I'm getting the thing, but thank you guys so much.